Well, good evening folks on a Friday night here in Australia on Blood, Sweat and Metal. I have got a special guest to join me for 20 minutes to have a chat about the latest album. And I'm speaking to Cradle of Filth member Danny Filth. How you going, Danny? I'm good, thank you. Good. And I have got some news to start off this interview and only just came in early this afternoon, Australia time. The album that we want to congratulate you on is the latest album that Hammer of the Witches just came in the very first week on the Australian music chart, which is the ARIA chart, at week, this week at number 28, which is the highest debut charter for Cradle of Filth. It's not a bad game. And we want to congratulate you on that success. Thank you. That's cool. So, yeah, um, let's talk about that. With the success that you guys have been give, been getting over the, the years and the course of the career of Cradle of Filth, when you started up as the band, do you ever thought about the success that will come after the album came out? Or was that a, just a growing process as time went along? Well, seeing as uh, the first album came out in 94, which yeah. is 21 years ago, um, it has been quite a lengthy journey, to be fair. Um, all kinds of things have happened, highs and lows, mainly highs. Um, but when we first envisioned starting the band, I think as most people do, you, you have this fixed idea in your head that, you know, you, you picture yourself on a big stage with lots of people and things go going wonderfully. You don't picture yourself in an empty room with like one man and a dog watching you. So you have this idea that that's what you want to achieve. Whether you do that is another matter. But yeah, um, yeah we've been very fortunate in the fact, worked very hard. Um, we've, we've, we've done that and more yeah and one of the most important ingredients when you start a band is hard work does pay off eventually well yeah I would definitely recommend that yeah. hard work you know if you've got anybody if you're starting a band out and your drummer's being a bit flaky and saying, oh, no, I can't do Thursday's rehearsal because I've got to go to the cinema with my girlfriend and you can't use my PA pretty much flip your drummer off and say, well, you know, you need a bit more commitment, mate, mm. because there are so many bands and so much great music out there. Oh, and the think. music industry is a little bit on its knees at the moment because the whole digital age, mm. that you really have got to be something special mm. to make it in, in today's musical society. Yeah. Um, so commitment is pretty much of the order, I think. I want to ask about that commitment, including with this album... The Hammer of the Witches. How was that commitment for you guys? Like you started off in the nineties, and you come into the new millennium. Now you're into the new decade of the twenty teens hood, so so to speak. But I want to ask: Has that commitment ever faltered, or did you see a member not pulling their weight here? That you need to sharpen them up a little bit, or someone is spending too much time on this? Well, we've yeah. been through. We, we, I was checking out, and I'm uh, sorry, I didn't know this, but I was checking out our yeah. Wikipedia page, and apparently we've had 39 ex-members. Mm. So we, we have been through the, uh, the wars, so to speak. Mm. We've got two new guitarists on, on this record, but yeah. that was born out of necessity because we undertook a co-headline tour with Behemoth at the beginning of last year, mm. and we already knew that one of the guitarists couldn't do it because of personal reasons. Mm. So we had to replace him, and then... Literally at the 11th hour before this tour started, our other guitarist who had been suffering from quite a severe neck injury, we found out that he was undergoing major surgery, so he couldn't even pick a guitar up, let alone play it. Yeah. And he indeed came down to the London show to wish us well and whatever, because we, we managed to find someone else, Ashok. And um, yeah, if we, didn't, we haven't looked back since then, because to get in the band, you know, there's a lot of criteria, you have to get on really well with the with the people and you've got to have the same ideology you've got to be a fan you've got to have like the musicianship and i can talk about how great the musicianship is in cradle of filth without any fear because i'm a vocalist so i just get to hang around with musicians yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, yeah. 
Um, but over the years, yeah, I mean, we've had people leave because they think they can do the job better on their own, or we've had um, we've had a few female keyboardists who've left to start families. Um, but I don't think we've actually fired anybody. Um, I think we fired two people, and that was like in the before the year two thousand. Yeah. So I think it's a case of, you know, a lot of work being in Cradle of Filth. We're a very determined band. We've done a lot of things over the years, whether it's a movie or, a, a, you know, a book, a comic book by a Kickstarter. Um, it, yeah, yeah. numerable videos and yeah. albums and masses of tours. And, and I think that's a killer for a lot of people. It does. Well, going on with this album, you guys are heading off to Varken very shortly to do the festival over there in a couple of weeks. I want to ask, are you guys looking forward to that? Oh, God, yeah, 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 totally. I mean, we've just got back from playing Rock Cars, yeah. which is um, a festival in uh, east, southeast Germany, yeah. um, Bavaria, um, near the Haas Mountains. And it's on an airfield. It's only about 15,000 people, but we played with Dream Theatre and Wasp and Soulfly and Fear Factory, and that was great, mm. uh, great weekend. In fact, I played, I went a little earlier because I played with my other band, Devilment, yep. on the Friday, and Cradle of Filth on the Saturday. Mm. Uh, that was amazing, just yeah. a really great weekend. And uh, because of that, Vulcan is so much better. I mean, it's like 80,000 people. It's probably the biggest uh, rock festival in Europe at the present. Yeah. Um, so subsequently, we're taking a big stage show and we've got, you know, a, a prestigious slot in the evening. So, yeah, really looking forward to that. It's going to be a killer. And I'll be watching via live stream here in Australia. I always do with Farkin. Oh, really? Oh, God. You're great. That's just put even more pressure on us. <laughs> I didn't even know that was happening. <laughs> well, I am a fan of the metal scene, so I do a podcast. So you, you've got a good guy here to talk about it because I've been following it. I'm yet to go to Germany, actually. I, I want to go to Varken, so never know. In the next couple of years, I could be over there. But talking about festivals, I just read a a little article in a rock magazine, classic rock magazine, I should say. The promoter for Download has basically came out and said that in the next 10 years, we won't get the headliners like Black Sabbath and Metallica or Iron Maiden. No, but, and I know why, because yeah. there's only... You know, the way the music industry is going is only really um, like about, I think we worked it out with um, our tour uh, booking agent. There's only about 15 bands that can actually headline the festival. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, if they do it one year, people are just like, oh, well, I saw Metallica, or I saw Black Sabbath, or I saw ACDC or Kiss. I saw them last year or I saw them twice last year. Yeah. And that's the problem. There's... There's only so many bands, and that, those sort of bands are a dying breed now. There was an article recently about Metallica, why there will never be another metal band as big as Metallica. Mm. Um, and that's the problem. There's a big divide between the bands that have been set up, you know, before the, before the trouble with the music industry came into effect, you know, digital downloads and stuff yep. like that. Um, the last of the big boys, really. Yeah. And... Uh, Nobody's really got up to their sales or up to the size they are because I think it's a thing of the past. Mm. And, and therefore, you know, there's, there's just a lack of bands that can fill that slot. Mm. And not only that, I just want to ask before we go into the album, do you think also with not the, the band, like you've got a, such a small amount of bands that can headline, but... At the same token, you have the fans putting bands in sub genres in the metal scene. If it's you got the new, we don't metal. need to do that anymore because nobody yeah. goes through a bloody record store anymore. Exactly, and that was the only reason. Exactly, the only reason you were called death, death, grind, gothic, doom, sludge, reggae, hip hop, new wave, whatever, mm. was because you know in record store you could find the record you wanted quicker. Don't need to do that anymore because everybody shops online, which is a sad state of affairs, I know. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's lost the magic because of that. Mm. I remember when I was young, you know, saving up money to go into town and you'd spend all afternoon walking around. You'd go back to the same record store about three times and you'd have a Uriah on an album that 
you hadn't written on your list, but you'd seen it, and somebody was wearing a Sepultura shirt, or they had spiky belt, and had some cool album titles, and there was a skull on the front or something, and you were going, yeah, I'm going to buy that. And you'll buy it, and you'd listen to it 20 times, even if you didn't like it, because you'd spent the money on it. Nowadays, people download like 10 albums in one go. Yeah. Don't have the time to listen to them. We'll listen to one song and go, oh, well, it didn't cost me anything. I'm not going to give that the time of day. Yeah. And that's the trouble. You know, things are glossed over. They've lost their, their magic. They've lost their prowess. And it kind of cheapens the entire deal. I know, obviously, I'm speaking on behalf of some people. Mm. And the majority of metal fans yeah. are very loyal. And they, they buy the physical products. They want to support the bands. And they know that if they don't, then the band won't be there anymore. Exactly. But, um, unfortunately, multiply that by, by the world on the grand scale. People have got better things to do than buy albums. And there you have it. That's the death of the music industry. And henceforth, why the divide between bands like Metallica and bands like Cradle of Filth or Lamb of God or, mm. you know, other bands that are big but don't even touch the upper echelons of exactly. the sales that someone like Metallica have reached in the past. Mm. Metallica don't reach the, the echelons of the sales they've reached in the past. They probably sell about a twentieth of what they used to, but are still the biggest in their field. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And I think what you just said there sums it up the way I would, I mean, people are downloading. I'm here to say, with the 36 years I've been on this earth, I have not downloaded illegally any material at whatsoever. I go and buy it, or what I do is now, due to the show, that <laughs> I don't steal, I buy it. I get, promo, I get promo from the record label, and then when it gets released in our stores here in Australia, I go and buy the physical copy. So, Yeah, brother. And I also buy merchandise when the tours are on as well, so, yeah. But going back to the album, I want to ask, how long did that process come about? And, you know, there's some great tracks on this album that I just want to mention just briefly before you answer the question. you got Right Wing of the Garden. That's a great video clip. I've personally been watching that many times on YouTube that I can count off my head. And another one is the, the Pleasing the Goddess, the official lyric video that was released on YouTube as well. I want to ask, how was all that came about to you guys? Was there a mind concept or was it just a group thing that this needed to be done in a certain way? Um, well, basically we spent a year <laughs> from its first inception, uh, four months in the studio until it was delivered uh, we actually entered the studio way more material than we should have done, so we dropped three really good songs, which will hopefully see the light of the day uh, in the near future. Um, but that was because we wanted quality over quantity. We didn't want to stretch ourselves too thinly. We had two bonus... There are two bonus uh, tracks, King of the Woods and Misery Chord, which are no less than any of the other songs. You know, we love all our songs equally, like children, except the rep company wanted to put two separately so that was that was the reasoning behind that but um no we just were very prolific in our writing we um we we had a fresh band which has come off the back of a tour we had a big canadian festival coming up so we're all very excited and buzzing and you know everybody came together um and we just ended up with a lot of material that we just kept chipping away at um I waited until I got about four songs through because any less than that, you can't really decide on what the direction is for, you know, you get two songs and the next one could be a bloody reggae mm. song. Then that will never happen. But the fact of it is until you get about three or four songs, you can't say, well, there's a discernible pattern or, uh, you know, a push for this record. So when I got those, it kind of gave me this ideology that, wow, this should be based on. And then I came up with hammer of the witches, which is the, English translation of Malice Maleficarum, which is a medieval handbook um, about the persecution of witches. Um, quite an evil book, sent hundreds of thousands of people to their death during the Middle Ages. Um, but our interpretation of that is more um, for the underdog, so the hammer is in the witch's hands. It's about um, retribution, revenge, uh, revolution. Um, and the music literally suggested that that kind of 
dealing and atmosphere and it just sort of went from there really without wasting too much of your time any further mm. I want to ask before we get into a couple of questions before we wrap it up I want to ask is the song The Flowering The Maiden Head based on it's I- Pleasure in the Goddess yeah, yeah. Was that basically a tribute to Iron Maiden? Because I mean, I'm an Iron Maiden fan myself, but when I say Maiden in the in the the title, would that any? Would that no, uh, no, no, no. Some people actually thought Hammer of the Witches was a tribute to Man of War as well. Yeah, <laughs> and no, but it could have been a. Uh, now you've mentioned it, it could be one of those little psychological things you just didn't think of because there is there's a lot of twin guitar harmony stuff very much in the vein of Murray, the classic Murray Smith lineup um, on the album and and especially that song as well. A lot of very intricate, you know, lead lines and and melody. And the album's very fast and uh, and very technical and and cinematic and dark and heavy, but at the same time, it's also extremely melodic. Um, So, yeah, that could have been a passing nod. First time I've I've actually picked up on that. So I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll use that in my next interview. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was passing nod to Maiden. Known well, about it for ages. Well, I, I wasn't actually looking at Maiden that way. Looking at Eddie Maidenhead. He's a figurehead of Maiden Eddie. So I thought, why not? But um, you mentioned Man of War. I I mean I'm, I read the title Hammer of the Witches. I my first instinct is Hammerfall, which is another great band over on the European days, and they'll be here very shortly as well. But speaking of festivals, um, will you guys consider doing Soundwave in Australia? It's a travelling festival. Well, we've been offered it, but I think yeah. Soundwave actually falls slap bang in the middle of um, our forthcoming US-Canadian yeah. tour, yeah. which is uh, scheduled for the beginning of January right through to March. Yeah. Um, although, um, yeah. due to, you know doing a, a huge amount of Australian interviews of late and the chart placement and, and the fact that we've never been to New Zealand and that's on the cradle field yeah. bucket list. Um, I've been talking, well, I've been talking with various um, booking agents and our booking agent and promoters to bring us over to Australia mm. for, uh, I believe, April slash May, which suits us fine because yeah. being from England, we're pretty much cold blooded. <laughs> and uh, it, it's your autumn i believe so it won't be too full on for us yeah we won't wilt <laughs> well i cannot wait for we you we played go- australia we played australia and i remember with uh it was melbourne and it was back in the day it was like 98 98 not 98 degrees it might as well be 98 degrees it probably was on stage and it was me full leather <laughs> no fans no air con and it was first time just arrived in australia jet lag to absolute fuck and then it was phew, <laughs> literally collapsed. I had yeah. to lie down in a park afterwards outside, you know. Yeah. With pretty much 90% of my body mass leaking out of my eyes. Yeah. I, before we let you go, I had a dream of being an Aussie to have a metal festival out in the middle of the outback of Australia, like the Nullarbor, where it gets like 40-odd degrees, quite the 50 degrees in the middle of summer. You think what you did in 98... Let's double that when you get it in the outback. I would love to see something like that. You don't have any noise restriction, no curve you, you're out in the middle of nowhere. It'll be like Varkin, it'll just be a great massive metal fest. Well it does have it sounds like the logistics the logistics of it could be a real problem though. Yeah, it will be. It will be. It does cost just a- like getting the ambulances out to pick up all the people and not used to the heat. That would be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, you need more than you. You need more than water and beer or alcohol. You need more than that. It, it gets so de- dehydrated out here. It's not funny. But Danny, I want to say congratulations on the the chart um, numbering poll. Twenty odd in the stray on the first week of Hammer the Witches. It's great success for you guys, and we cannot wait for you guys to. Hit Down Under very shortly. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much for the interview. Thank you. You take care, mate. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.